Welcome to Rich Conversations. Today, we're joined by a great friend of mine, Justina Wynn, and she's joined us before on episode 22. For this conversation, we recorded inside Justina's apartment, and you know, she's such a welcoming person. You can watch us on YouTube and see some of her plants, candles, incense. Incense always sets the mood, right? I, uh, I always wish my apartment was as cool as hers. Of all the friends, I gotta say, Justina probably has the best taste. Overall, just great vibes. Justina and I spent a lot of time together over the past year, uh, which is interesting because, you know, in a year where we're so isolated, we still found time to um, spend quality time together, right? But in this episode, we discuss a number of different things, how she spent 2020 and what she's learned from it, how she conducts the, the phrase market research, using immersion and empathy to discover new ideas and perspectives, her current cultural influences, and what the music you listen to says about you. As a DJ, you know, obviously she has a, a very close connection with music and what she plays, there's some significance to it. We cover a lot of interesting ground. You can follow her on Instagram at Soup's Bass. And you can catch her on the weekends spinning some tunes as a DJ. Again, great taste. Enjoy our conversation. Let's begin. So we're here with Justina Wynn, and she was on episode 22 of Rich Conversations, and a whole year has passed since then. So much, <laughs> so little has happened, right? Been so crazy. We, I mean, we met, and then like literally like three weeks later, Corona hit. Yeah. It was crazy. So what was your 2020 like? I mean, I mean, I, we spent a lot of it together. Yeah. So. I feel like we did. Um I feel like the first few months were kind of crazy. Everyone's trying to get their bearings right. I just remember time being so elusive and I don't know. I just, I think all of us were going through these crazy emotional roller coasters. And then finally, as your body starts to acclimate, your brain starts to acclimate to your environment coming into, I think coming out of like, you know, about by summer to fall. And then of course we went into winter when we, everyone's just like, Oh my God, I mean, we're used to this, but also like we're getting crazy because we can't go anywhere. Everything shut down. Um, 2020 was really interesting, but I, it was actually very, very good for me. I think, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it was a time to kind of slow down, mm -hmm. right? You think about- And you're, you're one of the people that are like, <laughs> pedal to the metal. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've had like one day to myself a week and then now I have all this time to myself, which was so so nice like i forgot what it felt like to just like stay home and just like chill out i got to do a lot of like home renovations and like you know adding things to it because i'm spending so much time here now i have to care more about it and i yeah. wanted to make you know not and at the time we didn't know how long we were going to be in this so it's like might as well get comfortable now and, and get as much as you can you know worked on at the house um but I, like i said i think it was a, a really good time for for self-reflection um, you know, I think humans, or at least, at least in the U S were kind of at the helm of this idea of the hustle of modern life, not only mm -hmm. this idea of overconsumption because of like the Amazons of the world has created us in this on-demand economy and everything has to happen now, but also we glorify this idea of the hustle. And so, yeah, we do. right. <laughs> and we just don't know how to take a break. And we hear about the self-care stuff, but like, I don't think it was until really 2020 when we actually many of us got to really like hone in on what does self-care mean to each of us individually? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you think of the wellness stuff and oh, okay, you can go to a yoga class or get some bath bombs or blah, blah, blah. But like self-care means a lot, lot more. It's, it's meaning, you know, there's a lot of different things, whether it's, you know, pursuing a creative project or projects that you never got to finish. I had so many house projects that I hadn't finished. Right. <laughs> um, so in that sense, it was really nice to slow down and really get you know, completely focus and immerse and do something that I wanted to do, like create or, you know, even if it's painting or something more mindless, it was just really nice to just kind of slow down and do those kinds of things. Yeah. And we're, we're in Justina's space right now. And Justina has like, <laughs> oh, she, what? she's got such an incredible <laughs> vibe. She's got all these different plants. We have, what is, we, we always have incense going when we're, <laughs> when we're at each other's place. 
What is this now? So it's it hasn't fully turned on, turned on yet, but I just okay. lit it. But um, it's basically called a backflow incense. And this uh, dish that it's on has a hole through the middle. Um, and basically the little cone that you see here is has a hole also in the middle. So as it burns, the smoke kind of goes sucks from underneath and into the hole from this like particular plate. Oops, and I uh -oh. just knocked it over. And I'll have to relight that. Um, but basically, then it flows like water, and except it's smoke. Yeah. So it looks really, really cool. It's just so cool. got the coolest stuff. <laughs> I got this when I was uh, visiting, where was I? Oh, my gosh. Oh, the Pacific Northwest. I was in Portland when I got this. They have a okay. lot of gypsy stores. Gypsy stores. They call them gypsy stores. Yeah. Yeah, Justina's, Justina's space is, is like, I don't know. It's just so so you. And like of my friends, I would say Joe Anhalt and Justina have like the best taste. And Joe's going to join us in a few episodes from now. And so we have we have the incense, we have the smoke, we have the candles and the, the plants, the fauna. You got to have the, the nature, you know. We live in the city. It's nice to balance. So what was your biggest revelation of 2020? Oh man, I think like there's like a number of things, right? I, I think there's a number of things that we were aware, we are aware of, but we really didn't pay a lot of attention to. And again, slowing down or the fact that I didn't really ever watch media or like the news as much as I probably should have until, you know, that was one of the only things I had to do is sitting at home. Um, and so I think a lot of the revelations that we had in 2020 coming from all this kind of um, tragedy and just like anxiety and, and fear and all these things is the revelation of hope and the fact that like the revelations actually offer a chance of course correction. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the revelations I think is, you know, we, it's almost like as a minority person, I know of the inequalities, you know, being a woman, being a woman of, co of color, that has always been a thing, even though I've been one of the lucky ones where I haven't had anything super detrimental that was so tragic or traumatic for me. But knowing that these things exist and it's almost like sometimes you feel like, oh, what can be done? It's just how it is. It's systemic, blah, 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 mm -hmm. which you know is the case. But there are things that we can do when we realize that even though during this time we were all stuck in our houses and we couldn't connect necessarily. But the fact is the beauty, the, the beauty of like the fourth industrial revolution, which is then technology and digital connection and social yeah. media and this, and this uh, connectedness allows us to mobilize faster than we ever have before. Even if we physically can't, even though I would say during even 2020, I think there were physical mobilizations as we saw throughout the world, but um, or throughout at least in the US too. Um, but I think like the fact that we were able to that we are able to really take into consideration like this is the shit that we're in right now and we need to make changes. Um, and there's a really interesting um, theoretical model that's called the Strauss-Howe generational theory. And you've got both sides thinking like, you know, there's some people who are for it and some are like, well, this is like, well, there's no really scientific proof, blah, blah, blah. This idea that every 80 years, um, our different generations have different, play different roles and millennials actually have this role of playing the hero. And that's kind of what we're seeing now is we are yeah. seeing all this chaos and this tension um, between the like, you know, traditional versus progressive way of, ways of thinking. And not that it hasn't been started by our you know, generations before us, it has. But now we're seeing like, I think it's just a serendipitous kind of moment where you know, the intersection of technology, the intersection of wokeness, if you will, and media and the idea of, of information is transparent. Mm -hmm. And the more information we have, the more transparent it is, the more, you know, knowledge that we have and knowledge is power. And we're able to use that and figure out where, I mean, now faster than ever, we can, we know where the resources are. We know where we could, what we can do. We can mobilize faster. Um, so I think it's such a powerful tool. And so I, I, you know, I see that that's happening, happening, even though we, I felt like we slowed down and there's some pauses in a lot of things, but now we are able to kind of like, course correct the things that have 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 been happening um and the world economic forum has called this era that we're in now or this time that we're in now called the great reset and it's because all these different um um economies you know and every all these different countries and us and you know everywhere else in the world 
we are figuring out how to how to beat COVID and how to you know um, change our systems or acclimate to this this whole new reality, and this is the time to rebuild our global economies to be more sustainable, mm-hmm. more inclusive. I mean, we're seeing things like work more together. Yes, <laughs> especially because Western civilizations. Oh, by the way, is this. this supposed to be on fire? Oh, there, there we, we go. go. Oh yeah. By the goes. way, like Western civilizations, Western civilizations are known to be more individualistic societies, individual, individualistic cultures, versus Eastern society societies like Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea. Those are more collectivist cultures. And so, actually, a lot of my work um, that I've been doing in the past year is talking about this idea of moving from this individualistic mindset to more of a collective mindset. Um, and I think that the tensions now are still there. I think politically is even there. You can kind of feel sort of like there's a tension. If you think about it, right versus left, whatever you're standing mm-hmm. in, there's a lot to do with individual versus collectivism mm-hmm. and on both sides of that. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a, it's a really interesting facet of, of how we're, how we're moving. And we're seeing that why like this collective activism that's happening, this idea of moving from, from an indiv- individual standpoint, a sense of, I, of belonging. We used mm-hmm. to like want to feel like we belong to something. And now it's a sense of identity. So yeah. this movement from belonging to collective identity. And, and I think with the digital era today too, it's easier now more than ever to, to feel like you are a part of some sort of movement or some, some sort of feeling of identity because you're connected to so many different yeah. people in so many different facets. Yeah, so much is going on. Yeah. Uh, interesting you bring up um, Neil Howard William Strauss. Episode 25 of this podcast, <laughs> we, we uh, talked about the book Generations and these generational cycles and these personality types that each has. And you're right about the um, historical cycles and now we're in a secular crisis. Even in the prologue of this book, it said... Uh, uh, the crisis of 2020, and then the nation's public life may go undergo swift and possibly revolutionary transformation. So we see that history has these these cycles that happens, and we can use it to then build and create the future. And that's that's what's so exciting. So exciting because I mean, history kind of repeats itself in different ways. Yeah. but as a generation, you get to make your your mark on the world, which is so cool. Yeah. So I've heard you. I've heard you use the phrase market research before. <laughs> You're conducting market research. What, what does market research look like to you? And what are some unique ways you go about doing market research? I mean, market research at the end of the day is the study of human behavior in, in, uh, as, um, in respect to a product or a brand or a service or whatever. Or it doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be... I want to study by, you know, a group, a certain group of people. For me, in record research happens to be more product or brand focus. So what we're trying to learn is, um, you know, what are the behaviors of, of our consumers or our audiences? Um, how do they use our products? Or if we're launching a new product, how would they use their product? How would this fit into their lives? Um, what is the perception of brand? You know, if we're running a campaign or we're you know, launching some sort of, you know, um, big idea, is it receptive? Is it going to work? Does it, does it resonate with people or is this going to be a complete shit show? Before you put something out there, you want to test yeah. to see with a smaller audience if it has any legs, right? And I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. I mean, you've got anything from, you know, one-on-one interviews to um, focus groups, meaning, you know, several different people Mm -hmm. within a group. It could be by age, it could be by ethnicity, it could be by region, different ways that you can slice and dice the audience. Um, then you've got, um, surveys, which can be done in many different ways. It could be done in person. It could be online. Um, you know, there's also like user research in terms of like digital. So maybe we're trying to test out, um, you know, if a website is, is easy for someone to use or if it's logical flow, then you test through, you know, platforms that way. Um, hi, Clarice. And um, then there's in the field or in market research where you can study people in the actual um, environment that you want to study in. So in the store, how, are they, how do they shop? What are their behaviors? How do they interact with the product on shelf? So how do you find how do you find like when they're in the store how they're interacting? How do you observe that? 
Well, so there's camera, you can have cameras okay. set up or you have people kind of just walking around in, you know, like just kind of walking down the aisle. Someone could actually be in person there and just like walking around and observing. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes you just know, you let people, uh, cameras, for example, yeah. can also be a thing too. Um, and then there's also other ways, but there's, there's this particular way that I've tried to do things and I try to do something different where I tried to blend the idea of creating and curating an experience um, for the for the people who are researching in the environment of or in the in the life or in the week the day of the life or the week of the life of a consumer so for example one case study was I um, I took my creative team to New York because many of them had never been to New York before and if they had they kind of only had the lens of like yeah. going to Times Square and being a tourist but yeah. like what does a day in the life of a, you know, 20 to 30 something millennial woman who is a New Yorker, how does she live her life? Yeah. And so we did everything from taking the commute that she would take from, say, Williamsburg and Brooklyn to the mm -hmm. lower financial district in Manhattan and seeing all the things that she would see. So you're really experiencing this. Yeah. yeah. I want like you have to smell the smells, feel the feels, taste things like all the things that this person would 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 feel and would do. And then along this kind of agenda of living the life of this person, also speaking to people along the route. So like, also just like, you know, we went to a bar, we spoke to a millennial woman who works at a bar and, and, and in doing so, you know, we had a very um, specific audience in mind for the specific product, okay. which happened to be an, you know, a woman who was kind of white collar job, who worked at the office, blah, blah, blah. But in doing this kind of immersion, what we call an ethnographic scenario design, um, we learned that, you know, people in the service industry are a huge target market that we're like not even thinking about that would totally use this product because it really fits into their life and how they, you know, between work and home and everything like that. Um, and the fact that we also learned that the industry itself is such a huge industry in New York that it would be amiss if we didn't also target this, this this particular audience as well. So sometimes you learn new things, you know, insights. So by through actually immersion. Doing, yeah, through immersion. Through immersion, you discover stuff that you didn't. Exactly. Oh, right. Because you can you can plan, 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 but until you actually do something, or or be somewhere, you may not even notice these small details that come up. So. So how does one, you know, if they're not a market researcher, how does one enhance their own life experience by taking that kind of mindset on? Like, what do you mean? Like, could you apply that immersion idea and design hey. <laughs> and apply it to your own life to enhance it, to see things that you're not seeing? Oh, for sure. You know? I think it's like, it's almost like, you know, we already do this kind of thing when we use Google, we like deep dive mm -hmm. into, and we go into rabbit holes of, of certain things. And so it's the, it's the first thing is the curiosity of it. But the next step is like actually going out and physically going to explore it. You can read about it online all the time. You can talk about it with other people, but like to go live it and to say, okay, you have an intention to go actually explore something and really put yourself in a place or to, to go learn about it, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable. I think when you don't feel comfortable with something, it's like when you're the most open to learn about something new, you know, and it yeah. could be in a positive or negative way, but the fact is it can change you in a way that you probably didn't even expect. So curiosity is the first step. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what trends could you see emerging coming out of 2020 with different brands and companies? Well, it'll be interesting to see from an experiential side, from a, like a, you know, when you think about events and stuff, yeah, um, how that's going to come to life again, because it's already starting to happen, which is like one of the most exciting things. Like what I'm excited for is like that to me, that idea of collective experience, because, you know, right now with, with COVID, everyone's kind of isolated in a way we're slowly becoming not as isolated and we're having more shared experiences, but the level of shared experience on the spectrum of more and more people in a place is something that we haven't experienced yet in over a year, right? Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what those larger collective experiences will look like. Um, another thing is, especially with all the cultural wars that are happening now, what I call cultural wars, as well as, you know, um, 
the political turmoil and tensions that we're having that we, we will continue to have. And this, we're not out of this cultural war and this, this divided war for a long time. It will be interesting. What do, when you say, I'm sorry, go, yeah, continue. No, 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 go ahead. When you say culture wars, yeah. kind of define that and how do then we resolve these, these disputes and these issues? I mean, I think it's the evolution and progress of people that allow us to, it's empathy, really. Deep mm -hmm. understanding on both sides, right? Um, the cultural wars I'm talking about, it, it actually has seeped into po politics. Right. When you think of race, you think of gender, you think of all these things, but also, um, you know, traditional views versus progressive views of how things should be, religious versus non-secular views, et cetera. Um, and I think, like, when, we, when both sides have a deep understanding and know how to move forward with each other in a way where we can respect each other, that's the only way we can move forward. But part of this kind of regressive or, um, and I don't think traditional is a bad thing. It's only when you feel, when you think that that is the only way to go and you don't accept everything else. And that again is the root of that all is empathy. Empathy is so important. And, and empathy is almost like, to me, like business acumen, like you have, a, you can have a certain uh, level of it, but not everyone can really have it. And it's not mm. something that you can fully, completely learn either. There's only so much, right? You either kind of have it or you don't. Um, and unfortunately, not all humans have empathy. Otherwise, this world would be perfect. Well, how, well, how does one <laughs> gain more empathy? I mean, it's, it's, it's part of it is the curiosity of exploring and putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. It's a very deep understanding. It's not... So there's a difference between sympathy and empathy, right? Sympathy right. is like you know, less of this deep understanding and really about, and empathy is really about putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's going and learning about some other culture or, um, you know, talking to someone who you wouldn't really talk to normally, um, or it's going to learn, you know, it's really, again, it's learning about different things and having an understanding of a different point of view. It's about traveling, which I cannot wait until we can actually travel again. I think traveling is one of the most humbling things, especially coming from, you know, living in this country and all the things that we're going through now. I mean, like, I'm I'm so happy we're fighting for the basic rights that we deserve as humans. But also at the same time, if you go to many, many other countries out there, they don't even, there's not even, um, I, I was speaking to an Uber driver who was, I believe, from Israel. And he was talking, he's a real turkey, I can't remember. Um, and he was just saying like, it is, no, no, sorry. He was from Algeria. Okay. And he told me it is against the law to protest, to even protest yeah. anything. And so, you know, it's, you, you feel really grateful for, for the fact that we do have a lot more rights. It's not where we want it to be. But again, look at the, look at history and how, you mm -hmm. know, we only got equal rights, quote unquote, you know, less than a hundred years ago. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, but we're in that, we are part of, we are part of that movement right now. What we're seeing our forefathers in, in sense of like, even over the hundred, like, you know, hundred years ago in the last, in the last century fighting for these rights. And now we're, we're going to continue to fight for it for a long time. I don't think in our lifetime, we're going to ever, we're going to see the change that we want to see, but that's because it needs to be passed on by generation and generation, you know? Yeah. Who would you say your top five cultural influences are right now? So I've been kind of in a bubble, I feel like. Um, and I think that's part of probably COVID. Um, I've been kind of just really focused on um, this, like the culture that surrounds me right now that I can touch and that I can mm -hmm. evolve or move or be a part of. Um, but I will say I've been I've been watching John Oliver the last week tonight with John Oliver just to get my like yeah. baseline of news and and politics and things like that um, because I just feel like you know especially with especially with the last year it's just so overwhelming to read the news and I just it just is I don't have the space for it right now like I feel like it's just not where I where I want to put my yeah. energy to. Um, so John Oliver is one just to get that kind of baseline and also just to, you know, bring awareness to the, to the issues that are really, really important, I think. Um, and then just like, you know, local folks and local um, uh, movers that I feel 
but are trying to do something. So my friends over at Style and Out Network, who you know you have yeah, yeah, on, your, yeah, yeah. on your show, um, Logan Eleven, who where I get to DJ every every um, every weekend. But you know, try there we're trying to build a community around love and unity, and I think that's really really important. I love that that's like their focus. Um, and we're looking to, um, bring in like the queer community to do performances and things like that. So just to really be a community be a place where people feel they can just be, and there's no, there's no like, you know, you know, dress to impress or there's no, like none of that. Check yeah. That you just come as you are. Come as you are. Um, and then other groups like, uh, true Chicago, um, or fat milk. My friends are at fat milk who they just launched their brand in November, and it, it, it's near and dear to me because it's part of Vietnamese culture and that's the part of my background. And so to see a brand that actually resonates really, really well with like the now culture, the cool, the, the, the you know, the cool culture right now, right? <laughs> yeah. to, to, to make it that way, because yeah. I will say a lot of, um, you know, if you look at Asian American like um, brands or, I mean, just even, you know, you go in Argyle or Chinatown, like, we're starting to see a shift in branding and the way that they're coming about. Cause it's always, you know, it's in the past, it's always been like the worst in marketing or design and things like that. And now we're seeing that, you know, it's, there's ways to, you know, our generation is helping bridge that gap, you know, with that older generation and what their, their kind of mindset was to bring all that into, yeah. to where we are now. Um, and Fat Milk was doing that. They want to be part of the culture of empowering you, empowering culture to be, um, what it is, but then through the guise of this idea of like, you know, Vietnamese coffee and authentic Vietnamese coffee, but, but made in a way where, um, any, you know, anyone can really relate to. And so I think it's really interesting. Um, and then other than that, I've been watching a lot of forensic files. I don't know. That's <laughs> that's like, that's that's nice. I just, I, I love, and it's, it's a, it's a show that's been around since 90, 96. And I, I've always watched it, but I've been rewatching a lot of the episodes and, um, if I wasn't doing what I was doing now, I would be a forensic scientist. Nice. And so it's just so interesting. The reason why I love it so much is um, it's not about the true crimes and all that stuff that I know a lot of things are, you know, a lot of that content out there is right now, but it's the medical, it's the science that goes within it, like solving crazy uh, cases with like a single dog hair or a single piece of thread yeah. that was found, you know, it's just, there's a there's mix of serendipity along with science and the crazy like you know um uh you know equipment and, and things like that that's out there that allows us to really know that just blows my mind every time anything with science blows my mind but it's just it's really interesting yeah yeah it's just very yeah what communication platforms are you on most um instagram is the only social platform that i'm really ever on and i feel like it's really to keep up with uh people like my close ring it's all through dms it's all private messages but then i also use it to um promote any of the the things i'm involved in you know whether it's djing or um you know for something with under under um privileged or marginalized communities um and then i think texting sms and then microsoft teams because for work we have to use that <laughs> microsoft teams microsoft okay. teams interesting mm -hmm. So you use Instagram as kind of like a, uh, that's like the big apparatus that you use to communicate. Yeah, I haven't, I kind of refuse to get on TikTok because I know that's a new thing. <laughs> I just got I, on TikTok I last week. I feel weekend. like the attention economy, our attention's already like this. And I feel like being on that would just continue to like exercise my brain in that manner. And I don't want that. Even though I will say like the content I'm sent is TikTok, our TikTok content. And um, it is very entertaining. I just don't think I could. I just can't. I, I don't watch don't it. It's just to create, though. Yeah. So, and it, it yeah. is a way because then you can use that and you can create it, and then and then deliver that on other platforms. Right. You want. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Do you think? Okay, this is a. I'm interested to hear your take on this. Do you think music? By knowing the type of music that someone listens to, do you think it says something about them? For sure. And I can tell you that I use this, I used it, well now I have a partner, so I don't know this a bit. I use it to like 
I mean, I think a lot of friends who are music heads too, or, or snob music snobs, if you will, um, will tell you this is one of the first things that they ask someone, a potential suitor or suitress or whatever. Um, and it is, it does because I can tell if you're into super mainstream music, that means you listen to the radio all the time or you tell, you know, I, and I, you know, I hate mainstream stuff because it's the, the whole background of what that is. And in the music industry, like that's a whole thing and how formulaic some of this music yeah. is. And it's just terrible to me. Um, versus like, if you're someone into very, um, diverse tastes of music that me, that tells me that you love exploring different cultures and histories of where music comes from. I mean, the music yeah. is so, such a large, it's like language. It's like, there's just an infinite amount of feels or infinite ways to, to, to digest it. And, and it tells me the, your style. Cause I also feel like, I mean, like if you're country, if you're a country music person, then you, you've probably got a certain style and you've got a certain lifestyle and things like that. And I can tell that a little bit about you, but I will say, you know, not everyone fits in that perfect mold, but it will tell me a little bit about you. Um, so say, for example, the way Justina and I met was that I was at the bar bartending <laughs> playing Miami horror. So what goes through your mind when you hear someone play Miami horror? I'm like, that person likes to dance. They like to be happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's great. Like, and you know, I, I think it's, you know, I appreciate people who, who like to listen to all sorts of stuff because then I feel like you dive in, you have an ear for different sounds and you don't like just listen to the, what you're given or what's expressed to you, but you're going out and finding stuff. And some people like obscurity. Some people like to go chase the history of things. It just, mm -hmm. it just tells me, cause like, again, if there's so much footprint in the music that you can trace a lot of that stuff back to many different ways and, and different platforms and things like that. So I feel like, um, you know, and some people like, for example, love to go to, you know, record shops and just go just look at vinyls in different sections and just go pick music that way. Um, I personally love finding music through other people, other cultures, um, or, you know, if I'm watching like a, a movie and something comes on that catches my eye, like I always have my notepad ready in hand to just really? write down the song okay. or Shazam it. Because to me, like when I curate my music, it has to mean something to me. It's, it's hard for me to go through like a bunch of different artists and just start listening to all their like albums and just go, you know, start cure, like picking them. Like to me, I almost leave it up to a little bit to serendipity of how I find my music because like, I, Interesting. it just makes me more attached to it. So when Justina DJs, so if you ever get a chance, check it out because it's so much fun and <laughs> your, your playlist, it's like, yeah, how, so you find your music kind of serendipitously. Sometimes, and then sometimes okay. I do go, and, and if I, like, you know, there's some artists where I'll, I'll find that I'm like, I'm going to go deep, I'm going to deep dive into this person or persons, and I'll, I'll do that. Um, but oftentimes, like, it's, especially, like, when I was trying to disconnect more, especially mm -hmm. this year, I let that kind of come to me versus me go actively seeking it. I was, you know, maybe I'm going to, I'm, I'm going on a Twitch stream to see another DJ and I hear something. That's one way of doing it. Okay. I'm watching a lot of different shows nowadays or movies or obscure things, you know, internationally. Um, one way I was actually finding it for some time was through Tinder, the app where um, people can tag a featured song to their profile. And at the time I had it where I was paying for this membership where you can swipe all over the world. And so I was, swiping. I love how you call this market research too. Yeah, I do. Cause it, cause it kind of is though too. Cause <laughs> in your job, you, it, it is. You're I mean, looking at all these, people. these, these folks as like, as just entities of like, Oh, what are, the, <laughs> what are the patterns I can see? But I would swipe all over the world and just start writing down the music that they would have featured in their, in their profiles so that I could go explore you know, music from, you know, Australia or Bangkok or Australia has got a lot of my favorite bands are from Australia. Mm -hmm. It's got a little bit of tropical vibes. You're on this Island, you know? Yeah. But then, yeah. A lot of groovy. What does it say about me that I never listen to sad music ever? Like ever. That like, I feel like the sounds to you, the way that your brain processes it allows you to feel an emotion sort of way because 
I feel like it's it doesn't mean that if you listen to sad music, you're a sad person, but there are sometimes those modes where you do and that's how you want to exacerbate it or you want to explore it. Um, but I feel like maybe for you, it's like just that is just how your body, re the way that your body is reacting to the sounds is how it makes like makes you feel no matter what. And that's how you want to feel like, you know, so it means so that tones. it means that when I listen to music, I'm more connected to it than everybody else. <laughs> I don't know about that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I, I feel like you have a, you have a, an intention to feel a certain way and you need to hear this, like these sounds that make you feel that way as well. And you want to feel that way. Right. Um, Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> What's okay. So what is something that you're curious about recently? Oh my goodness. I hate these questions. <laughs> it's so open-ended. I know. What have I been curious lately? God, I feel like it's like I'm curious about a lot of things, but I feel like when you put me on the spot, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, what am I curious about? I'm curious to why Clarice, my cat, has been talking a lot more than usual lately. <laughs> well, there has to be a reason for that. I think so too. I think honestly, it's because we've been spending a lot more time together. So she's, and cats are vocal because they're usually, usually talking to humans. Um, but now since we spend so much time together, I think that she's just always constantly wanting to tell me how she feels. I will say in the last couple months, now that things are kind of normalizing a little bit again with my schedule, I've been out of the house more than usual. And she is super needy, like crying when I get home, more lovable than usual, like. Really? Yeah. I'm still trying to crack her for it because I I don't know if that's gonna be how she is um, when things go back to normal because she wasn't like this when I had a normal schedule. But I'm wondering if it's, again, just like as we kind of acclimate to our environments and, and change our behaviors according to what we need to, they're doing the same sort of thing. So you think with, with COVID and everything, Clarice has changed her own behavior oh, and sure. now it's it's like she doesn't exactly know what what she doesn't really she doesn't feel like in a permanent state right now because now things are sort of changing again right I feel I feel that for sure she's 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 there's a lot of behaviors in the last like few months that I hadn't really seen before or more so it's more augmented than usual She's sweeter than usual, because maybe because I'm leaving the house more and she doesn't want me to leave. Like she's become way more attached. Um, I don't know, it's like really, it's really interesting. So I wonder if that's gonna sustain when things actually go back to normal or if this is like the new her, How which do I don't you, hate it. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think about dog people versus cat people? What, what's the difference between cat owners and dog owners? Well, they always say like cat owners are a little weirder. I'm just joking. <laughs> that it's, um, well, I guess it, it also depends on what kind of cat you have because you have cat dogs too and then dog cats and things like that. Mm. But I feel like cat people, you have more of a relationship with a cat than like it's similar to having a, an actual relationship with a human, like in a romantic way, because both entities are somewhat independent right? Mm -hmm. It's not like a dog where they're at your every, every whim, you know, they're so dependent on you. Not saying there are relationships, there are relationships like that. Um, but they're, at least for me, cause I, I grew up with, uh, dogs. And so I've only known dogs and it wasn't until I got Clarice that I really understood what cats were. And I wasn't sure if I was really a cat yeah. person. Um, but there's a level of independence that they have where it's almost like I'm always feigning for their love, right? Like mm -hmm. before dogs, you know, they always have your love. Like they're just like, you can do whatever and they'll just love you regardless. With cats, there's a little bit of a chase, which I really enjoy. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's, it's, I feel like it's a little bit more of a, there are more obstacles and it's more of this like push pull sort of relationship that you have with humans. That's how it is with humans. Yeah. Like imagine dating. That's mm -hmm. kind of how it is. You're trying to figure each other out. Like sometimes they're like, there's a little bit of chase, but then sometimes there's not. It's just, yeah. it's like a, it keeps it interesting. It's not just one note, mm -hmm. but it's really, um, I think it's, it just, at least with, with Clarice, this is my experience with her. 
Um, I mean, I love, I'm still, I still love dogs. It's just a very different sort of relationship. So, um, but I, but I feel like cat people are a certain, I, I can't really quite certain put way, my, yeah. yeah, I can't quite put my finger on it. There's not like a one sort of like attribute to a person that makes them a cat person, but it is, I mean, cause cats are weird. Yeah. So their owners kind of have to be <laughs> weird too, I guess. I'm experiencing this thing right now where, uh, I haven't lived with a dog for like ever since I was like a kid and I moved in with someone who had a dog. Uh, what would that be like six months ago? Maybe a little bit more than that. And I just realized, so whenever I come home, the dog is just like so excited to see me. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this feels so good. This yeah. is, this is awesome. Untraditional. <laughs> but then people are, other dog owners are telling me not to like shower them with love and embrace it when you come home because then they like, they think you're gone permanently. So now when I come home, I have to like, oh no. It's so hard though, but I know. why? But why? Right. Give, give so them that's as what I'm much wondering. love as they're giving you. Yeah. You know, I mean, like it's still questionable how much, like I mean, questionable, but how much they actually know, like, like where's the proof of them actually believing that you're gonna be gone forever? I don't know if they actually. Know they're all that. yeah, but they're also animals, so you don't know that. Exactly. Yeah. So like, why not give them the full love and attention they deserve as much as they've given yeah. you? He likes attention for a little bit, then he goes off and just he's done. Love it. <laughs> yeah, he's like the perfect. He's just like you know, yeah. So what's something you're excited about coming up? Um, summer. For sure. I felt like winter was super long. Super long. Um, I think the summer is going to be insane because, you know, everyone's getting vaccinated. Not everyone yet, but a lot of people are getting vaccinated. And especially, you know how Chicago is in the summer. Yeah. It's insane. It's fantastic. And now it's going to be another level of insane. You know how they say it's going to be like kind of a, um, a roaring 20s, really. Um golden era rectified that yeah exactly um so it'll be it'll be nice and interesting to see a sense of normalcy there are larger events and festivals are gonna be put put on early fall starting early fall concerts are starting to show up back in early fall so there will be that sense of collective experience and i cannot wait for that yeah um as much as i love my alone time and and even though i'm djing now it's great but it's just not the same of being part of a crowd and and feeling that same sort of energy as everyone else um so i can only imagine that heightened form of that energy because everyone's yeah. been so bottled up for a while very excited for that um and then i have a couple of family weddings my brother's getting married and my cousin's getting married in november they've had okay. to uh delay their their weddings oh so the one of yeah in uh, relationships like that where you have to postpone everything because of COVID. That's exactly. And so they are the the first of our 26 cousins on my mom's side. I'm the oldest that are to get married, the first wow. grandkids. So it's going to be a hell of a party. Yeah. Parties. Um, so I'm very, very excited to see all my family in one place. And it's just, it's just, and we love to party. Like when we all get together, we are like, <laughs> we are, we are, uh, we're the crazy family. So I'm really, really excited for that. So the last question I have for you yes. is what do you think all humans have in common? So I think all humans have a sense of purpose in life and, and that, that is a very wide range of, of things, right? The, the thing that kind of keeps us motivated waking up every morning, um, something bigger than us, the thing that drives us really. Um, and it's been studied over the last like 60 years or so from even, um, oh, hi Clarice. <laughs> <laughs> um, from even uh, a psychologist, a Viennese psychologist named Viktor Frankl he was in the concentration camps and Nazi concentration camps back during World War II. Man's was, Search for Meaning, great book. Yes. Um, and he was, <laughs> come on. And, you know, he saw that uh, prisoners who showed a greater sense of purpose um, were able to overcome starvation and slave labor and things like that. Hi, baby girl, come here. Um, and so it's this idea, this explanation that Friedrich um, Nietzsche said was 
those who have um, a why in life can almost can bear almost any how. Um, and I think this is true. I mean, it doesn't matter what background you have. I mean, if you're from a lower socioeconomic class, a lot of times they say adversity and hardships can sometimes lead to a sense of purpose. And when they studied that in um, black American youth, it was a way of protection from them, from negative experiences in their environment. Um, and then there's correlations to the sense of purpose to, um, you know, health. So, you know, uh, less stress, anxiety, stress and anxiety, um, and, you know, not being diagnosed with certain diseases and, you know, they're still studying on whether the, there's a correlation, but understanding if it's that the sense of purpose is driving these health benefits or if the benefits are allowing them a space to have that sense of, of purpose. It's not determined yet on that? I or? think there's, there's both. There's sides yeah. to both. It's not like there's no, there's no, um you know, for sure answer, but I, it's, it's, it's seen in both ways. It's happened in both ways. Um, but I, you know, I think we talked about Ikigai before and mm -hmm. in the last, and I, I'm really, I feel like that idea of purpose, you know, a for yourself from an individual level is important, right. For all of us. I mean, again, it could be anything from, you know, somehow changing the world or leaving some sort of positive cultural footprint to just, making the most of every day and, and, and loving the ones around you, you know, again, it doesn't have to be anything, nothing's too big or, or too small. Um, where's I going with this? Um, <laughs> do you think, like... do you think most people have a sense of purpose? Or do you think I don't many think people everyone, are trying to, I, I mean, are still it's, finding it's like it. saying it does everyone like, does everyone have empathy? No. I mean, it's the same sort of thing. I, I think they may not necessarily be aware of a sense of purpose. They may just be doing things and say like, I just need to eat to survive or whatever. But, um, I, I think my optimistic sense of self says that hopefully there is some sort of purpose, whether it's about, whether it's a sense of meaning, like mm -hmm. a search for meaning, you may not have a complete sense of your purpose, but you have the curiosity or the, the desire to go somewhere. I, I mean, yeah. for those who are waking up every day, like what is, what motivates you? Mm -hmm. Like everyone has some sort of motivation. Like, again, it could be something super, super small and direct to something larger and more visionary. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to think everyone has a sense of purpose, you know, whatever that could be for them, because it could be something completely different yeah. for every individual. But I think that what is so beautiful about the idea of purpose is once you understand your individual purpose, there's this idea that there is that purpose then somehow aligns with the collective or greater good. Yeah. And we see this a lot more in a collectivist culture, like say they did studies in Korea where, um, for the Korean youth, they saw the idea of a sense of purpose for themselves as not an individual thing, but more of a collective thing. And then in China, it's more of three different, uh, buckets of purpose for them. It's, <laughs> social Great. it's <laughs> it's social it's professional um and so you know i think every culture kind of also defines that a little bit differently and so individually you you have something different too <laughs> of course she waits to the end to wanna <laughs> she heard me talking so, about her and so she's just so would you say that like the common idea with humans is that we we want this sense of purpose and belonging and believe that our own individual efforts can lead to something greater for all. Yeah, I would. Yeah, and even the because the purpose at the end of the day, individually, is around the ego, and everyone has that. Mm -hmm. And ego, I believe, is a root of all evil. I mean, not, it can be good too, but it is a root of all evil. If you think about any sort of terribleness that goes on in the world, is the protection of it or the 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 righteousness of your ego and all these things right mm -hmm. anything you can say yeah. about the ego it, it can turn in different ways so the idea of purpose is channeling that ego in different ways so whether your purpose is to like as i watch in forensic files take revenge on people then that's one thing right <laughs> yeah um but your ego could also be then 
then uh, float into something that, um, you know, makes the, your tribe better or your, or your whole, you know, or your community better. Yeah. And that flows that ego into more of like a collective yeah. ego. Um, so yeah, I think everyone has that and it just, you know, depends. So yeah. Well, thanks for coming on today and thanks for uh, letting us in your space. Of course, this awesome always. space. <laughs> so, space. so beautiful. Thanks again. Thanks, Rich. It was an honor.